One thing that makes ghosts scary to many is the idea that they cannot be fought off physically if one was ever to attack. While most cases of hauntings only include sightings, there are some that are violent, especially in the case of poltergeists or demonic spirits. One fascinating case that doesn't fit into either of these brackets is a case that happened in December of 1803, which not only reported a ghost who would lash out at unsuspecting travellers in the dead of night, but was eventually put to an end by being shot by a terrified man. I'm Bleaky, and in today's video we take a look at the Hammersmith Haunting, a supernatural case that not only had many documented sightings and reports of people being attacked, but later helped change British law due to how the entity met its end. During an incredibly cold winter in 1803, a small village on the outskirts of London became the location of a haunting that saw the villagers terrorised by a ghost. During the December of 1803, many citizens of Hammersmith claimed to see a ghost covered in a white shroud who would approach travellers out late at night and would sometimes physically attack them. Once darkness fell and the drop in temperature caused a fine mist to sweep into the sleepy village, the paranormal entity would appear as soon as the church bell struck one in the morning, moving around the fields running either side of Black Lion Lane. The spirit is believed to be that of a man who took his own life by slitting his throat a year previous, who was also seen haunting the local graveyard of St Paul's Church. Those who witnessed the wandering spirit described it as large and white, which certainly meets the criteria of a ghost, but I wouldn't put much faith in a police sketch. On one occasion, a pregnant woman who was never actually named in the report crossed near the churchyard at around 10 o'clock at night. She walked as swiftly as a bump would allow her, with the grass sprouting from all the graves, brushing against her ankles. As she passed one particular tombstone, however, the prickly brush of grass changed to the feeling of icy cold fingers. The woman looked down to see a tall white figure rising from the tombstone. The woman let out a scream and attempted to run away, but the size of her bump and the speed of the supernatural entity meant that she was caught up with instantly. The sheer terror caused her to faint. The next morning, she was found by neighbours and taken home to bed. The terrified woman frantically retold the account of the spirit. Sadly, she never recovered from the fright and the exposure to the freezing conditions, passing away in a bed along with her unborn child. On another occasion, the Hammersmith ghost scared a driver of a wagon which was pulled by eight horses and carrying 16 people. It scared him so much, in fact, the driver jumped off and ran away, leaving the horses, wagon and the passengers alone at the scene. By the beginning of 1804, many people in the Hammersmith area of London claimed to have seen the spectre, with some of them recognising it as the local man who had taken his life. Now, those who took their own life were not allowed to be buried in consecrated ground as it was believed to be a sinful act. Was this why the Hammersmith ghost was wandering church grounds in the fields close by, longing to find peace and pass on? The villagers grew tired of their village being terrorised by the entity, with a group of them believing that the ghost was a person covered in a sheet that was intentionally scaring people. As a result, a mother and her unborn child had lost their lives. It was time to put a stop to it. Now, this is where things get really scooby-doo. A group of men armed with pistols began patrolling the streets in the hopes of catching the person who was orchestrating a haunting in order to get their cheap frills. Unfortunately, the village had so many lanes and paths leading in and out, it was too hard to cover all access points efficiently. On one occasion, however, one of the men spotted the spirit and chased after it. Like a really rubbish Halloween costume, the man dropped the tablecloth he had <laughs> put over his head. This is where a man named Thomas Millwood comes into the story, who unintentionally changed British law for the 200 years that followed. Thomas was a bricklayer who left his home as he always did in the late evening of January 3rd, 1804. Naturally, he was wearing the clothes of his trade, although on this night, he was wearing brand new linen trousers, a white flannel waistcoat, a white apron and freshly cleaned white shoes. 
in a village that was incredibly paranoid about running into the Hammersmith ghost, Thomas had been mistaken for the spirit on two occasions previously. His wife had even asked him to wear something different as it could scare people. In fact, in the official court hearing of the case, his wife said, On Saturday evening, he and I were at home, for he lived with me. He said he had frightened two ladies and a gentleman who were coming along the terrace in a carriage, for that the man said, he dare say there goes the ghost, and that he said he was no more a ghost than he was, and asked him, using a bad word, did he want a punch of the head? I begged of him to change his dress. Thomas, says I, as there is a piece of work about the ghost, and your clothes look white, pray to put on your great coat, that you may not run any danger. I don't know what answer he made. He said he wished the ghost was catched, or something of that sort. But Thomas, stubborn in his ways, refused to wear his coat, a decision that ended in tragedy. As he was walking down Black Lion Lane, Thomas was mistaken for the ghost for a third and final time. While Thomas strode down the lane, unbeknown to him, one of the men hunting the ghost was lying in wait. Francis Smith, a customs officer, felt his heart jump into his throat as he saw what looked to be the Hammersmith ghost gliding through the screen of fog. Smith's opinion that the ghost was a man soon changed, no doubt influenced by fear. This wasn't a man covered in a tablecloth. It was a clear form with a ghostly white appearance from head to toe. The man leapt out and cried at the approaching spirit, Damn you! Who are you? What are you? I will shoot you! Whether Thomas didn't know how to react or was sick of being accused of being a ghost, he simply kept walking along the lane towards Francis Smith. Engulfed in fear, and after calling out again and getting no answer, the man pulled the trigger. Smith expected the bullet to pass straight through the paranormal entity, so it was a shock that the spirit simply fell backward onto the lane. Smith didn't hang around and went to fetch the night watchman, William Girdler, to tell him he had stopped the Hammersmith ghost. The night watchman rushed to the scene and discovered not a supernatural form, but the lifeless body of Thomas Millwood, with his once pristinely white waistcoat now stained in crimson. The watchman ordered Smith to go back to his lodgings after he had become hysterical at realising what he had done. Girdler and several other men carried the body to the Black Line Inn. It didn't take long for the coroner to rule that Thomas Millwood had been killed by a single shot that entered through his mouth and exited through the back of his neck. During the coroner's inquest, those who came to take the body said the night had been dark and gloomy and that he might not have seen Thomas's face. Smith had several character witnesses come forward to claim that he was a nice man, who went out on the night of the incident with the best intentions, believing that he could stop others from being terrorised and certainly didn't intend on killing a man. When asked about why he did it, Smith said that the sheer terror he felt caused him to pull the trigger and that at the time he didn't even know he had done it. Regardless, the coroner judged the shooting a rash act of willful murder and sent him to the Old Bailey to stand trial. Smith's defence was that he killed Thomas because of a case of mistaken identity and that he was not guilty of willful murder. Before the trial, the judge reminded the jury that regardless of how people felt about a person intentionally scaring others and Thomas appearing to be the perpetrator, the facts were that Smith was deliberately carrying a loaded gun which he used rashly before having any right to aim and shoot it. While the trial focused on the shooting, there were witnesses called to the stand to prove the existence of the Hammersmith ghost as a form of defence for Smith. The idea was that if the ghost was real, then the fear Smith felt when faced with what he thought was the spirit was justified. One such witness was Thomas Groom, the servant of Mr Burgess, a local brewer living in Hammersmith. Groom explained that one evening he was walking through the churchyard between 8 and 9 with his jacket held under his arm and his hand buried in his pockets. To his shock, he saw a person moving from behind a tombstone, which somehow quickly moved towards him and violently grabbed him by the throat. As he choked, another servant who was walking closely behind heard the commotion and ran to Groom and asked what was wrong. Suddenly, the man was released. Groom punched out into the air in front of him and felt something soft, which he described as a great coat, although nothing was there. 
The jury eventually returned a verdict that Smith was guilty of manslaughter, but the judges said that there was not enough evidence in the case to downgrade murder to manslaughter. The jury was then sent away again and told that they either find the man guilty of murder or Smith walk free through lack of evidence. What a decision to make. Send a man who made a genuine mistake to the gallows or let a trigger happy killer go free. The judge also reminded the jury that Millwood was not attempting to run away or attack Smith and even if he had been the Hammersmith ghost or a person pretending to be it, the crime would have been a misdemeanor or nuisance that would not have been a capital punishment, especially a capital punishment that Smith had the right to act out self-righteously. The jury eventually returned with a guilty verdict, with the judge sentencing Francis Smith to be hanged, with his body being donated to a medical college for dissection. Now, the guilty verdict amassed a lot of public sympathy, especially from those who were present in the courtroom, which put a lot of pressure on the judge and the court. The public interest became so great, in fact, that the Lord Chief Baron reported the case to the King. In just over three weeks, Francis Smith received a pardon from the Crown, with the only condition being that he would be locked up for one year. In a huge twist, the attention of the case caused a local shoemaker, called John Graham, to step forward and admit that he was the man wearing the tablecloth taking advantage of the Hammersmith ghost legend to get revenge on his apprentices, who apparently told his children some scary ghost stories, leaving them traumatised. I guess nothing says far of the year like going out in the dead of night with a tablecloth over your head. The admission seemed to put an end to the Hammersmith ghost sightings, but only temporarily. In 1824, people began seeing the ghost once again, with some even believing that the spirit was that of Thomas Millwood, who had replaced the legend that haunted the village over 20 years previously. The spirit is now frequently seen around and inside the Black Lion Inn, the place where his body was taken straight after his murder. The Hammersmith case exposed a huge issue with the lack of defence of someone who believes that their actions, no matter how violent, was done in good faith, so they shouldn't be considered an act of willful murder. In the case of the Hammersmith ghost, the judge believed that Smith was without a doubt guilty, while the public, Lord Baron and the King believed that Smith committed manslaughter because he believed that the Hammersmith ghost was about to attack him. As this was a grey area, he simply walked free after a year of imprisonment and hard labour. Everything changed in 1983 when the law was clarified by judges that determined that a mistake can be a defence only if it is reasonable. An unreasonable mistake can never be used as a defence. Another example of a supernatural defence that was unreasonable was stated in the Outlines of Criminal Law written by Courtney Stanhope Kenny which shared a story from 1880 where a woman in Ireland placed her naked baby on a hot shovel in an honest belief that the child was a deformed changeling that was sent to replace her real child. She thought that her original child would return if the changeling was put in danger. This of course was not the case and the child died an awful death. This was a clear case of an unreasonable mistake and the woman was convicted and sentenced. Another example of this would be with the infamous witch burnings, where superstition dehumanised living people and somehow made it justifiable to kill them. To this day, the locals of Hammersmith believe that the original Hammersmith ghost returns to the graveyard every 50 years, with the last sighting being reported in July 1955. The spirit that is seen more frequently, however, is that of Thomas Millwood, who sadly became part of this story solely because of the clothes he wore and a man who wanted to find an earthly explanation for the famous ghost story, but ended up just like the children of the actual hoaxer, scared of the unknown. So, was the murder of Thomas Millwood a genuine case of mistaken identity, spurred on by fear, or were the actions of Francis Smith irrational, careless, and an open and shut case of murder? Let me know in the comments section below. If you enjoyed this video and would like to watch more supernatural and paranormal content, please make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell. And until next time, sleep well friends.